Hi, uh, as you may have guessed from the title, today I'm going to be looking at the first Assassin's Creed, which has spawned the Cash Cow series that we know and mildly like today. Assassin's Creed is arguably the strangest installment in the series, as it's where it awkwardly found its feet. It did a lot of very innovative and interesting things for the time, but being Ubisoft's first open world game, it also made a lot of mistakes when it came to its overworld, mission structure, and storytelling. It's a very conflicted game, and so I thought it would be interesting to talk about it and explore its fundamentally confused design. This review will be going into the story and every other aspect of the game, so if you haven't played it yet, then I suggest you do before I ruin it all. Although it's definitely not for everyone, so I may just be saving you 10 hours instead. Assassin's Creed is set in the near future of 2012, which is now depressingly the past. You're introduced to Desmond, a man who has been taken hostage by a mysterious group known as Abstergo. Desmond is important to them because his ancestors were part of a secret organization known as the Assassins. Unfortunately, all of his ancestors are dead. So, by using a machine called the Animus, Abstergo are able to view the memories of one of Desmond's distant ancestors to discover a secret that he held. The game explains this ability to view the memories of long dead people because the memories of every one of your ancestors is stored within your DNA for the evolutionary purpose of giving us pre-existing knowledge from birth to, to aid in our survival, which we would see as the phenomenon of instinct. The ancestor in question is Altair, a master assassin from Syria during the Third Crusade. After a botched mission to recover a coveted artifact, he is punished by being stripped of his master assassin rank and offered redemption in the form of assassinating nine targets. A majority of the story follows Altair and his journey to assassinate these nine targets. But another significant portion of the game explores Desmond and his stay in the Abstergo prison. He slowly learns more about his captors and their plans which relate to Altair and the search for the mysterious artifact. This alternating story between the two characters sets up the pacing of the game. The player will wake up as Desmond and after a short lecture from your captors, he'll climb into the Animus. You then play as Altair. As a low-ranked assassin, Altair will start every mission by heading from the assassin's headquarters at Masayef to one of the three major cities that make up the bulk of the game. These comprise Acre, Damascus and Jerusalem. For the first time you visit each of these cities, you also have to traverse the Kingdom, which is a huge Hyrule Fields-like area which is unfortunately just as barren. In terms of the overall game, this is the least significant area in terms of content, but sadly not in size. The Kingdom Field holds nothing in it plot-wise or mission-wise, aside from a few optional collectibles. This is also the only area in the game where you're given a horse to ride on, which sets the tone that you should be running through it and not exploring. All the guards in the area will attack on sight if you ride your horse too quickly, which you'll obviously be doing to leave it as soon as possible because it's pointless. Thankfully, you can fast travel to each city once you reach it the first time, but the first few times will just be a tedious slog through empty fields having guards periodically chase you. Once, they reach it, once he reaches the city, Altair then has to head to the local Assassin's Bureau, confirms the details of the assassination target, and then heads out to gather information. The player has to climb up viewpoints where they synchronize, which basically just shows up missions on their map. Players then complete a set number of missions, gather information, confirm everything back at the Assassin's Bureau before heading out to do the assassination. Once completed, they head back to the Assassin's Bureau again, confirm the kill, and head back to Massey after debrief with Al Mu'alim, the head of the Assassins. This process repeats for every one of the nine assassination targets, with you going to a city, learning information about the target, and then heading out to kill him before returning back to Mass AF. The number of assassinations the player does per session goes from between one to three, but once they've completed all the available missions of that mission strand, they then go back to Desmond, who wakes up from the Animus. He's then sent to bed before starting the whole process again. There is an element of play with Desmond as well. The player eventually finds a pass key to escape his room, which is given by an unknown accomplice, leaving him able to walk around at night. Over the five sessions you play as Desmond, in between Altair's sections, you will eventually be able to hack the two laptops of the scientists who are guarding you, as well as a third laptop hidden behind a locked door. Desmond's sections are ever much quicker, since the amount you can do per session ranges from one thing to zero. If that sounds repetitive, then the truth is that it is. Assassin's Creed sets up the structure from the first mission and it never lets up until the very last hour of the game, where the game finally mixes up the formula with an hour-long sequence of straight-up combat, which falls into a familiar pattern of repetition as well. The problem is particularly troublesome in the Altair sections, where a majority of the playtime is spent repeating the same missions. In this way, the developers show their inexperience in making an open-world game. There's plenty of ways to make an open-world game, but the structure perfected by Rockstar in GTA 3 has been the one to stick. There's a reason for this. It's a great system for open world games because it mixes up your playtime by both offering multiple mission strands at one time, as well as recontextualizing your missions. Basically all missions in open world games are comprised of very basic templates to understandably simplify development time. These can be made up of mission templates such as fetch quests, time trials, or escort missions. 
One thing open world games like GTA and The Elder Scrolls do very well is that they contextualize these mission templates in order to blur the fact that they are repeating the same actions over and over and over again. This could be anything as simple as a fetch quest, where somebody might tell you to go and find a sword in a cave, or the next time they might tell you to go and find their friend in the cave. They're effectively telling you to do the same thing, but the context of the mission makes it feel very different. The problem with Assassin's Creed is that it bypasses both of these. It separates each assassination target into its own city, with no other assassination targets available within that same city. Because of this, you can't switch quest lines easily. Instead, you have to leave and travel between cities just to switch missions. It also headlines its missions as the templates that they are without recontextualizing them at all. The missions involved are pickpocket, interrogate, eavesdrop, flag capture, assassinations, shop destruction, escort missions, and flag collection. These missions are titled as their mission template, with the game outwardly telling you that each eavesdrop mission is an eavesdrop mission. Most of these missions also aren't instigated by talking to a character who can contextualize the mission. Eavesdropping, interrogation, and pickpocket missions are all started by just targeting a victim and then carrying out whatever the objective is. It's only the flag captures, shop destruction, assassination missions, and escort missions that are started by talking to other assassins. But they do little to set up the mission other than simply saying what the mission template is. Look how well the game hides the fact that this is a flag collection get mission, for instance. Safety and peace. You want information about the city, I suppose? Right now, I don't have time. I must find some flags which have been stolen from our cache in the rich district of Damask. I could help you. I have been eavesdropping, and I have learned much. However, I have erred. I had some Masiyeth flags to deliver to the bureau leader, but I lost them when attacked by thugs. Could you find them for me? Flag missions are a particular problem. The game never pretends that the object to be picked up is anything but flags. It's always flags. They could very easily change it to something being like, oh, pick up 20 notes, or pick up a letter, or pick up a package to help me complete this assassination. But instead, they always just tell you it's just flags. You're always picking up flags. Speaking of flags, there's also 400 additional flags to find spread across all the cities of the game, as well as the huge hub world that is the Kingdom Fields. These are optional, but I wouldn't re recommend anyone look for them. They're hidden in every nook and cranny of these huge worlds and are not worth anyone's time. They also don't, un they don't unlock anything, which is especially cruel given the time investment to get them. They mislead you into thinking they have something interesting to hide and then give you nothing for your investment. The game had another chance with its optional content to mix up the game, but instead just gives you a completely arbitrary task that eventually leads to nothing. I may sound bitter about this, and that's because many years ago I was one of the many idiots who was more of a collector file then than I am now. I've now learned after the several tens of hours I put in finding all those flags. So the game's first issue is that it's extremely repetitive, even in its limited optional content. But the mission types that are in the game are also an issue, since they don't suit the way the game is designed to play. Firstly, we'll look at the controls and how the gameplay of Assassin's Creed works, and then come back to this and see that what you do within the game and what you can do within the game are completely at odds. I think one of Assassin's Creed's biggest achievements is in its control scheme. The game's control scheme is known as the puppet system and is an extremely elegant way to lay out all the controls. The puppet system works as such. The top face button controls the head, the left face button controls the left hand, the right face button controls the right hand, and amazingly, the bottom face button controls the legs. The game establishes that assassins hold weapons in their left hand and use their right hand for all other interactions. Assassins use their heads to spot targets in a system known as Eagle Vision, and clearly they use their legs to move around. This information and all the available options are always displayed in the top right hand corner of the screen to make sure players are never confused. But once the player is made aware of what interactions they're able to actually do in the game, you'll often find that you're looking up there less and less and work out everything based on the context. If you need to do something that isn't killing, use your unarmed hand. Need to kill, use the armed hand. It all follows on very well. The game recycles these face buttons across two social profiles. One is known as low profile, and the other is known as high profile. Profiles are switched between by holding the bumper button, and profiles simply make the action buttons either perform low profile, i.e. socially acceptable actions, or high profile, i.e. not socially acceptable actions. When the bumper isn't held, then you'll perform low profile actions. These will be pushing people softly out the way with your right hand, blending in by walking slowly with your legs, and going into eagle vision with your head when standing still. When you're in high profile mode, you'll perform faster and less acceptable actions when you're hitting the face buttons. These include shoving people out the way to avoid tripping with your right hand, and going into a free run or jumping with your legs button. You can't go into eagle vision when moving, so your head isn't an option during high profile. 
As I've said, the left hand is used for weaponry, so this is an awkward middle ground since drawing a weapon is never completely socially acceptable. However, there is a slight change based on the profile you're using. Bringing out a large weapon such as a sword will always draw attention to yourself from guards. However, more subtle weapons such as the iconic hidden blade will draw much less attention if you attack with it while in low profile. In a low profile, you'll stab someone, allowing them to stagger for a moment as they die, whilst you can walk away and blend back into the crowd. In a high profile, you'll leap through the air and stab them through the head, which will draw a lot more attention. Overall, this gives Altair a pretty wide variety of abilities he can do, all laid out in an intuitive fashion. The player can easily go from free running to stealth with just the release of a button. This gives the player a move set which is extremely action orientated and very versatile. And this is why the missions on display are so at odds with the controls. Of the eight mission types available, three of these involve simply listening to conversations or slowly following people. These are incredibly passive mission types, and although they may make up a minority of the mission types available, they actually make up a majority of the missions you'll play. So even though you have the ability to climb over roofs and fight tens of men and can stealthily move throughout the city, the game asks you to sit on a bench and watch people talk. Possibly when that conversation is over, you'll have to walk over to them and pickpocket an enemy, but this takes less than a few seconds. You may also have to beat up people for information when they go into a dark alley, but the fist fighting offers the most simplistic fighting style in the game, with no combos or moves other than defense and attack. So one of the few times you're forced to fight during one of these missions is with the worst form of combat system, as you punch, as you punch them, they punch you, then you punch them back, and it's whoever falls over first. Back in the Desmond sections, the only control the player has is to move at a walking speed and interact with objects by pushing any button. You can explore the lab and interact with objects and talk to people using this interact button, but that's about all you can do. Although this is equally passive and unengaging, it is at least compatible with the controls on offer since Desmond can't do anything nearly as athletic as Altair can. Sometimes these very low-key missions are tweaked more to match with Altair's skill set. When following a pickpocket target, the target may walk into a guarded area that will force the player to climb over a building to avoid detection. But these obstacles are singular, and this only occurs once or twice throughout the entire game. Later installments would go on to add variations, such as needing to eavesdrop on moving targets instead of just listening to them on a bench, but this simply isn't an option here. A lot of the game's missions are spent watching an in-game cutscene and then completing one action. These are all very at odds with the actual moveset that Altair has access to. The action-based missions are much more fitting of your moves, but they are less than half of the game, and since they have no variation or context given to them, they can also become quite repetitive. And creating boredom isn't something the game saves for later. The game sadly does its best to kill the momentum as soon as possible with a horrible tutorial that takes over an hour to do. Tutorial and cutscenes are thrown at you for the first hour of the game, and you're never given a good chunk of gameplay until all of this is over. The control scheme itself is relatively simple and it would have helped the game a lot more to have these actions being taught much slower throughout the game rather than just at one huge chunk at the start. The issue of a bad tutorial is obviously a bigger problem at the start, but the game's insistence on taking the player out of play is an ongoing issue which haunts the game until the credits. Primarily, a lot of the problems with the game is that the gameplay is always in service of the story. There's nothing wrong with story-heavy games, but I always find watching cutscenes is much easier when the gameplay has been designed to facilitate cutscenes as a reward. Having simple gameplay has always made me much more comfortable watching a story play out, as I know the alternative is equally as simple. Point and click adventure games like The Walking Dead have always made me much happier to watch cutscenes since the actual point of play is to unlock more story. There's nothing actually in and of itself satisfying about clicking on objects, it's the little droplets of story that are offered after it. But Assassin's Creed's gameplay isn't simplistic, the game is in and of itself fun to play. And when the game has allowed you to free run through a city, plan out an attack, assassinate people, and get involved in a hectic chase, it will then sit you down for several minutes to listen to some very poor dialogue, and the juxtaposition is made much more obvious because of it. And the problem is Assassin's Creed's story never leaves you alone. Every single mission is in the service of finding out information. Why am I racing to meet the informant? Information. Why am I listening to this conversation? Information. Pickpocketing? Information. Interrogation? Information. Then the main assassination will involve you heading to the Assassin's Bureau to recount all the information that you learned. When you finally head to your assassination target, you always have to watch them give a speech, you then kill them and have an extended chat with them, then you run back to the Assassin's Bureau and have another conversation, then you head back to Masayaf to talk to al Mulem. then you head back into the city to once again chat to the Assassin's Bureau. There's a lot of information exchange in this game and it gets pretty old after a while. Some of these cutscenes can be avoided. You can avoid heading to the Assassin's Bureau when you first enter the city, if you head straight to the missions. 
You can even avoid having to climb viewpoints and instead search the city for the missions without them appearing on your map if you want a more player-driven exploration experience. But inevitably the game will catch you, it will force you into cutscenes to enter the main assassination, which is itself comprised of two cutscenes just to start it. And then you have to do another two cutscenes before you can even end the assassination and head on to the next city. And even then, Desmond's sections will always be around to rear their ugly head to block you for a few minutes between missions. Our main issues with the story actually centre more around its intrusion, rather than the story itself. Because the story is actually fairly interesting. The setup remains one of the most original for a big budget title that I think I've seen. It's even amazing that this game got as much traction as it did. Whatever can be said of Ubisoft now, the fact that they were willing to put so much support behind this concept shows that they were at once at least an interesting com company. The main mystery throughout the game is the treasure that Al Mulim sent Altair to steal in the first place. After losing it through arrogantly stampeding into a group and fucking up the mission with a bad one-liner. And what is it you want? Blood. No, no, no. Altair is apparently executed by Al Mualim before he wakes up absolutely fine. He's lost his rank, most of his abilities, and his accomplice Malik hates him since he caused the death of Malik's brother and the amputation of Alex's arm during the first failed mission. This is an interesting premise, especially with the fake execution of Altair which immediately piques the player's interest after having lived through a very drawn out tutorial. Throughout the game Altair meets every assassination target, learns about their personal motivation, and also begins to see a connection between the target. This culminates in him learning that Al Merlin was at one point actually in cahoots with these nine people, who made up a group called the Templars, a secret community that wished to bring about world peace through the control of the people. The treasure is an ancient artifact of unknown origin called the Peace of Eden, which has the ability to create illusions and control the minds of men. Al Merlin has been using it as a tool to get rid of the competition so he can be the only wielder of the power. The artifact itself presents many interesting concepts which are discussed throughout the story, such as the consequence of this mind-altering treasure being used by great prophets and miracle workers throughout history. And aside from that, it's just cool to see a sci-fi like this set so far in the past. I would argue that the primary theme of the story is that of interpretation. The goal of both the Assassins and Templars revolves around the same maxim, or belief that creating peace between men is a good action. The Assassins wish to do so through freedom and education, believing men are at heart reasonable and good. The Templars believe men are stupid and must be controlled. We come to find that every assassination target Altair meets is attempting to initiate a plan to control the populace and bring about this peace. Some standout characters are Garnier, a doctor in Acre who is kidnapping and running experiments on people, Jabbar al-Hakim, who is a scholar in Damascus who is intent on burning books, and Abul Naquad, the merchant king who throws great feasts in order to invite those who hate him and offering them poison wine to murder them all. As a postscript, I apologise for my pronunciation of those names since I assume they're absolutely horrible. All of their motivation is guided by the same underlying philosophy, the creation of peace through control of the populace. As you gather information for the assassination, you learn their malicious plans, but upon confronting them, they make it very clear that their intentions had purpose. Garnier wasn't performing evil experiments, but instead curing mental illness of madmen that he took from the streets. Jabbar, who sets out to burn books, actually sees all the literature of the world as poisonous and filled with false myths of gods. He aims to restart mankind, to free them from these habits. The Merchant King wasn't just killing those who would be rude to him, he was killing those who would be treacherous and not function well in their new world. And the story goes out of its way to not frame Altair as the morally superior character. In fact, most of the people he kills point out that Altair uses the same methods as them. Then why hide? And why these dark deeds? Is it so different from your own work? You take the lives of men and women, strong in the conviction that their death will improve the lots of those left behind. A minor evil for a greater good? We are the same. He removes ideas and people from the world that don't fall in line with his own in order to seek a desired outcome. This doesn't mean that all the assassination targets have good intentions. Sibrand is an officer near the end of the game who has gone mad with paranoia of Altair's inevitable arrival. He started killing men, including priests, believing them to be assassins due to his fear of dying. Muchadin is the current leader of Jerusalem who tells Altair that the nihilism he feels from losing his faith in God has made him free to wield power. When you confront them, they both claim that it is their atheism which has caused them to react in this way, but Sibrand has done so out of fear, while the Muchadin has done so out of pleasure. Afraid. Of course I am afraid. 
But you'll be safe now, held in the arms of your god. Have my brothers taught you nothing? I know what waits for me. For all of us. If not your god, then what? Nothing. Nothing waits. And that is what I fear. You kill people simply for believing differently than you. Of course not. I killed them because I could. Because it was fun. Do you know what it feels like to determine another man's fate? The game consistently bases its characters around the same underlying principles. Firstly, that men must make their own destiny in the face of no higher powers. And secondly, that the best destiny to strive for must be the control of other men to bring about peace. But the way they all respond to this intellectual freedom ranges everywhere from utter fear, power madness, cruelty, and sometimes reason. And this is an interesting theme to lay the game's story upon. The narrative never feels boring for the most part, since each assassination is a subplot. You'll find yourself distracted by the intrigue of each individual character's story while awaiting the solution to the overarching narrative. And they're neat little, and they're neat little stories which are more than enough to hold your attention. Even Altair has a small arc as he becomes humbled and sees the error of his ways in being arrogant. His story is the least inspiring of the group, but at least it's there in some form, although nothing special. Desmond's own story focuses primarily on him discovering two or three pieces of information about Abstergo and himself. We learn that Abstergo are the modern day equivalents of the Templars, that they are searching for a piece of Eden to place on a satellite to enforce global mind control, and that Desmond used to be an assassin, but has since abandoned the group. We even learn some neat pieces of information, like the Templars being responsible for several conspiracy theories, like the Tunguska incident, which was a natural disaster in 1908 that saw a giant explosion which flattened 700 square miles of forest. It is a nest of conspiracy theories which AC plays on by claiming it was a failed experiment by the Templars who were using other pieces of Eden which have since been destroyed. But overall, Desmond and Altea's story is the weakest because Desmond doesn't evolve as a character at all, other than learning information external to him, and Altair simply learns to not be a dick. And even then, the rest of the story outside of them still ultimately falls flat in many areas, simply because it falls into a trap of routine that the rest of the game does. And that's the game's fatal flaw, it's completely imprisoned by templates. Missions are templates, the story is in a template with cutscenes doled out at the same specific points during missions. The investigations are templates, like how you carry out the same pattern from getting from Masiev to the final assassination. You do the same thing every time. You go to a city, complete a set number of missions, and then you go and kill the final guy. And after the first few assassination targets, it becomes obvious that the target will have a positive spin on their apparently evil actions. Some characters still stand out due to sheer charisma and interesting ideas, but since you know the twist is coming, it kills any sense of surprise. You know a cutscene is coming, and although the subject of the cutscene will be obvious, like going into the Assassin's Bureau, you know you're going to talk about the target, or killing a Templar, you know they're going to confess to you, you still have to watch the characters discuss the matter. And a lot of the time it feels like these cutscenes are just here, just because they have been before, with the characters going through the motions just for the sake of it. Having the cutscenes be skippable or simply not having them in the game would have been great, but you're forced to watch every one, with a majority of them having pretty tedious by the numbers dialogue. I can only imagine this was to make the development a lot easier, as they could map out the game simply from the beginning by having a set template of how each assassination should go, and I'm sure this was great as a design doc to take the pressure of making a new IP, but as a method of creating drama and fun in the game, it's a terrible way to make it. Although you're forced to watch cutscenes for arguably about a third of your playtime, unless you've decided that you hate yourself so much that you want to go and collect all the flags, the cutscenes are surprisingly light when it comes to being cinematic. The game's cutscenes never actually change camera angle during the cutscene, instead allowing you to do it yourself. During these in-game cutscenes you can select several shots such as far away, close up and mid, and none of which are particularly amazing to look at. During cutscenes the game introduces a glitch system, where you can press a button whenever glitches appear to have the camera focus on, focus on an important item within the cutscene. And during these moments the camera will be well framed on the important subject in the scene, just as any good shot should be. I'm not entirely sure why the game cinematics are done this way, since the system would be harder to implement than actually just having well-framed cutscenes. It makes me think that this was a method to keep players engaged during cutscenes, but the obvious problem with this is that if developers were worried players would get bored, then they should have just made them skippable or not had them at all. A lot of the times these cutscenes happen when there should be no reason for a loading screen, and even then the loading screens aren't excessive, so it doesn't feel like the cutscenes are hiding loading screens, it just feels that they're just made purposefully unskippable. 
And if you choose not to use these glitches, then you're rewarded with an annoying visual and noise which completely distracts you from anything happening on screen. Nine men he sent you to kill, yes? This is especially bad during the kill conversations after Altair is killed as target. There's obviously a lot of problems with these cutscenes given that these two are having a pretty friendly chat while being surrounded by guards. But since they're the best cutscenes in the game as they culminate each antagonist arc, I like them being there rather than not being there because otherwise I'd just be watching a lot more other boring cutscenes. When you, when you click the glitch in these cutscenes, the scene will change to the target wandering around, monologuing to Altair, and this is completely at odds with them bleeding out on the floor, so I found it really distracting. So when I decided to not activate the glitches, I was rewarded for this by an annoying glitch which completely kills any emotion that these scenes manage to muster up. The issue with overlong cutscenes and unsatisfying gameplay is centred on the fact that the type of game Assassin's Creed tries to be and the game that is executed are completely at odds. It sells itself up to be an investigation game where you gather information to execute the perfect plan. The idea is that you gather information about guard positions, find ways to enter the complexes that the targets hide in, and then use social stealth to cloak yourself. It's very similar to Hitman in that regard, using exploration and social stealth as its fundamental mechanic. But this isn't what you get. The information you gather is about ways to enter the complex, which range from anything from secret passages to befriending scholars to blend in with, who can then access restricted areas. Since these are the only two forms of entry into restricted areas, information collecting is effectively pointless a lot of the time, since you can only learn to either climb over something or blend in with a group of scholars. The game gives you a lot of maps and documents to plan an attack, but it ultimately comes up as nothing, and the game just simply isn't complex enough to have any reason to strategize. And this is made much worse by the fact that the game railroads you into a cutscene after you get near the target, so your ta tactics are limited anyway, since you'll always be funneled into an event that you can't plan around. You don't plan to approach the target and then kill them, you just plan to approach them in one of two ways, and then the rest is whatever happens after the cutscene. And this additional introductory cutscene when you approach the target could have easily been avoided. It's really the consequence of you learning very little about your target during information gathering. Usually you learn what they're up to and how to get to them, but you learn nothing of the underlying motives which you could use to deduce what they're up to. It means that when you finally meet them, they have to confess everything to you about what their true intentions were, or else you simply wouldn't know anything about them or find them interesting. The game's focus on story is the very reason that the game has to funnel you into an introductory cutscene with them. If the game was confident you already understood the character, it could let you sneak into their complex and then assassinate them in one go, confident in the fact that you had already read between the lines of what was going on with them narratively. But the devs can't guarantee this, so they're forced to split the final assassination up into small blocks, killing any strategy. Confusingly, the game even has a system in place to give you information about people while playing the game itself due to it being an information gathering game, but it saves all the narrative for forced cutscenes. The game would be much more engaging if you were able to discover the story and plot during play, which I would argue would be the key reason for making this story as a game in the first place. Even worse than this, the game stomps all of your information gathering attempts by having Altair announce information at his pre-assassination meeting that you haven't even gathered, making your information gathering feel pretty limp anyway. Abu Naqud is corrupt to the core and despised by his own citizens as a result. It appears he's been stealing money meant for the people of Damas and spending it on himself. And this lack of variety isn't just found in the stealth, the combat suffers from a lack of options as well. The game itself actually has an alright combat system. You have four weapons in the game in total. You have your hidden blade, which can only kill unsuspecting targets or else they block the attack. You also have fists, which are used for interrogation missions as they have no ability to defend or parry attacks and so you'll get cut down by people with enemies with swords. In terms of actually full-on combat weapons, you have knives and a sword, with knives having the additional benefit of being throwable across a distance, acting as a light ranged attack. The player is given a block, a parry move, a grab move, the ability to throw enemies, a dodge, and a defense breaker. All of these combat moves work within the context of the puppet control scheme very well, with grab being tied to the unarmed hand and dodge being tied to the legs. 
all the combat moves combine legs, unarmed and arm hands that use the buttons and parts of the body that you would expect, meaning that it's easy to remember how to do mildly complex actions even after not using them for a long time and you will go a long time without requiring these moves. And the problem behind this isn't the combat itself, but it's actually the enemy types. There's only three types of enemy in the game. There's a light armoured enemy, mid armour and a heavy. The only thing that changes are their attack speed, competency and blocking and their health. From very early on in the game you have the ability to face all these enemy types, so you learn to beat them with your basic attacks. As you complete assassinations you get promoted and you slowly unlock more combat moves. However, since you've mastered how to kill all the enemy types at the start of the game, your further moves become pointless since you've learned to play the game without them. So Assassin's Creed is a bit of a mess, it's an investigation game with limited investigation and a social stealth game with excessively limited stealth options. Combat is the most expanded area of the gameplay overall and even then it lacks the enemies to give it purpose. This isn't a good start. It's even weirder that the game holds your hand when it comes to investigating since the big final plan of the modern day Templars, which is to put a satellite in space, is found on a hidden laptop which you can avoid in the Desmond section. The game keeps its big explanation as potentially missable, but has all the minor information thrown in your face constantly. So now I kind of want to talk about what's good about the game, since I've, I've complained a lot about Assassin's Creed, but it's got some great things going for it. The parkour in the game is extremely satisfying. It's basic, being mostly automatic, with the player controlling only the direction and speed of Altair. You can unlock a grab move which allows you to grab ledges while falling which greatly opens up where you can free run to by preventing you from falling onto the street and having to slowly make your way back up to the rooftops. A majority of the skill from the parkour is finding good routes around the city which makes it a mildly strategic but I wouldn't want to give it that much credit but it's certainly not a reflex test. It would have been more interesting to have had more of the unlocks be about the free running rather than the combat since the free running would have benefited a lot more from being complex. However, in its basic form it's fun and the cities themselves are well designed to facilitate free running. Climbing is also very intuitive, since you can climb at any point of a structure that juts out further than 2 inches. Instead of awkwardly highlighting climbing points like having white areas such as how Tomb Raider does it, Assassin's Creed was revolutionary by having naturalistic climbing surfaces built into the architecture of the level. It's a feat that no other franchise has managed to match since, to my knowledge. The cities themselves outside of gameplay have a great atmosphere as well. Of the three major cities, each has its own unique feel, from the Saracen capital of Jerusalem to the English-held Acre. They all have a different colour palette, different architecture and great sound design that perfectly captures a sense of time and place. Walking around the cities is enjoyable in and of itself. There are market sellers selling their goods, impressive crowds that respond well to your actions, and annoying beggars to punch. I especially love hitting the English peasants in Acre, since it not only reminds me of home, but they're without a doubt the most annoying characters ever put into a video game. There's even street preachers who talk about the ongoing crusades. Since you visit both English and Saracen cities, you get to see both sides of the war, which carries across the idea of an ongoing larger conflict. So comes the English king and his infidel army. They leave horrors in their wake. Salah Hadin rides to meet him. Now they retreat to the south, begging Saladin to save them. But he will not succeed, for none can withstand the might of King Richard's army. He is graced by God. These preachers also preach that they are the chosen ones of God and he will lead them to victory, which further pushes the theme of differing philosophies based on a single maxim. It's not deep, but it's one of the few ways that Assassin's Creed uses the medium of games to push a theme. And I have been quite harsh on the missions, but a lot of them can actually be fun. Uh, the ones that involve time trials and assassinations are always enjoyable due to their rarity, and the first time through at least, the story was gripping enough to pull me through. But was Assassin's Creed a success? Well, maybe. It had an interesting plot, but sadly a plot that doesn't take advantage of the strengths of being in the game's medium. It had great gameplay ideas, but they weren't complex enough to support the game that it wanted to be. The story tries its hardest to rip you out of the game as much as possible, and worst of all, everything feels like it's built to a template which makes the whole experience feel very repetitive. But importantly, it does have one thing that most games will never achieve, and that's atmosphere. 
It really captures a sense of place and time that I've never seen before in a game and haven't seen since aside from in the Assassin's Creed sequels. It's original, brave, and the parkour in particular can be very enjoyable when you're left alone to actually use it. This is all topped off with a story that I certainly hadn't seen before. If you, were, if you wanted a new experience back in the day, then Assassin's Creed was certainly offering that, but there were still a lot of valid issues to dislike, so in a way it was the new experience equivalent of getting dysentery, certainly new, but not very pleasant. I hold Assassin's Creed dearly because it gave me something I've never seen before, but in terms of overall design, it's pretty indefensible. <laughs>